in mid-March. Spring showed signs of emerging, as it normally does in Washington, D.C. Cherry blossoms in full bloom. But other signals pointed to a year unlike any other in recent memory. As authorities advised the public to stay away from the floral display, and more importantly, each other. The recommendations and associated street closures, all parts of social distancing efforts employed worldwide to contain and mitigate the devastation caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, it's really an unprecedented event. It has reached almost every corner of the globe. We have people all over that have been impacted. In our fight against COVID-19, as in any public health crisis, the most obvious impact lies in the staggering medical statistics, surging numbers of infections and deaths. But as schools closed, businesses shuttered, and public gatherings of all kinds canceled or moved online, it's becoming abundantly clear the novel coronavirus has touched us all and transformed our world. There's a collective sense of grief or loss. People are feeling really lost. What is my world? What is normal? And as people struggle to adjust to new realities, behavior often changes as well, amplifying the best we have to offer and sometimes the worst. It's all part of the psychology of pandemics. In times like these, when large-scale disruptions override daily routines and jeopardize safe and secure futures, a whole range of life-altering actions often set in motion and sometimes spiral out of control. Such can be the power of language, something the World Health Organization recognized when it first classified COVID-19 as a pandemic. Pandemic is not a word to use lightly or carelessly. It's a word that, if misused, can cause unreasonable fear. Used in 2020 to marshal resources and a collective effort, the word itself has a way of conjuring up helplessness and despair. Images from our past, like the plague and the Spanish influenza. Using that word immediately brings up uh, a lot of emotions and fears, and uh, we need to be careful uh, and, and not enter in a kind of psychotic mood, oh, a pandemic is doomsday or things like that. Technology can help us adapt to these new circumstances. The way we keep traditions, communicate and conduct business, even while social distancing. But fear has a way of driving behavior, as we see in grocery stores and markets. We definitely see panic buying. I think that there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of unknown, and I think that in those kind of situations, people want to take action and try to gain a sense of control. I don't personally think I'll be affected by the actual virus, but I will be by the shortage. So, you know, just people panicking, it seems to be more of the problem than anything else, so. You know, no one needs 48 rolls of toilet paper, but because there's the potential of it being taken away and them not having it, they're grabbing for it. Of course, to many in hurricane-prone communities, this may seem all too familiar and somewhat reasonable. We know people often leave preparations to the last minute, despite repeated warnings. And especially when tragedies like the current pandemic begin elsewhere in the world. Feeling like it's happening somewhere else to someone else can be really detrimental to getting people on board with protecting themselves and their loved ones. Sadly, we have plenty of experience dealing with disasters of all sorts. In the United States alone, Hurricane Katrina and 9-11 stand as defining moments, inflection points in history. 9-11 was sort of a watershed moment in American history, and certainly the coronavirus pandemic, uh, you know, has that criteria. You know, we've been asking people to drastically alter their lives, and people are doing it. 
right? And you did see this kind of similar phenomenon um, after 9-11, like New York, you know, there was sort of this feeling of coming together and wanting to be a part of a community. Sometimes, however, a desire for communal cohesion can turn irrational and ugly. Because the origin of the COVID-19 pandemic lies in Wuhan, China, it also became motivation for a reported rise in anti-Asian incidents. There's really certainly been elements of people being um, typecast and stigmatized because they're Asian. I think to some degree a desire to have a scapegoat or an enemy that makes it a little bit easier to process some of the negative things that are happening to you. So one of the worst effects of an epidemic is the potential to produce stigma, right? And we saw that very uh, acutely with, with HIV AIDS. In the early days of the AIDS pandemic, the disease was considered the gay plague in certain circles. The major problem in the world today is not AIDS, but homosexuals and homosexual travel. Dangerous in its own right, this prejudice and hatred had unintended consequences as well. Closing us off to the possibility in a lot of ways that HIV could be spread heterosexually or via um, you know, sexual transmission between heterosexual couples. And this meant that we missed a lot of cases early on by focusing exclusively on gay, primarily white men in the United States, while ignoring heterosexual transmission. And, and this was devastating for all parties involved. The answer to these harmful actions and behaviors, then, today, or during any future public crisis, is clear communication and factual information. And you have yourself cloth face covering. Public education campaigns can be critical to mitigate the spread of disease, relieve stress, and even protect our long-term health. So we're asking everyone to be selfless for others so that we can protect those who are most susceptible to this virus. So in times of crisis, people become even more reliant on the media than they are in a typical situation. And so the media has a very important responsibility to communicate what is known clearly and accurately without a lot of sensationalization. And that's the message coming from the United Nations as well. Around the world, people are scared. They want to know what to do and where to turn for advice. This is a time for science and solidarity. But especially during times like these, trying to cut back on our daily dose of media can be beneficial as well. New York, a city no stranger to disaster, is now the world's worst infected city. High levels of media exposure after a disaster are associated with elevated psychological distress in the immediate aftermath. We know that that distress actually persists over time, and we know that that high levels of media exposure, that psychological reactivity, that can actually have negative implications for people's physical and mental health down the line. But in today's COVID-19 environment, there are few opportunities to escape, especially for healthcare workers and their patients. Many of us are sort of running to keep up. I think probably not all of us, certainly in, in my discipline in infectious disease, have had a lot of extra time to spend reassuring folks. Without an effective vaccine, or even a proven therapeutic treatment, and amid shortages of supplies, including personal protective equipment, nurses and doctors are the tip of the spear in this fight and bear the brunt of the emotional toll. People will be developing PTSD, severe depression, uh, grief reactions, and other disorders once this starts to wind down. Bear courage in going to the front lines really needs to be applauded by all of our society. We've seen that recognition play out around the world as music and cheers of gratitude echo in empty city landscapes 
And yet, despite the heroic efforts, the body count grows and social distancing mandates leave many at a loss, struggling to find a way to say goodbye to loved ones without endangering friends and family at public funerals. People tend to have distress when there's ambiguity. People like to have closure. That can be really helpful for people. COVID-19 is taking so much from us, but it's also giving us something special, the opportunity to come together as one humanity, to work together, to learn together, to grow together. The loss of life and livelihoods is devastating, but people find ways to make do and comfort one another during trying times. Morning. Morning, you're right. And this community is pulled together like we've, we've never seen. Uh, the Facebook group that we were able to establish has seen people pop into the shops for each other. Just the, the, the best of humanity coming out and people being there for each other. How are you guys? You're all right, how are you? Yeah, I'm all right, yeah, I'm all right. So, you know, maybe we will see people sort of reprioritizing, you know, what they value. I think it's also given a lot of people time to reflect. I've heard, you know, some uh, talk about this is a good time to call up people that you didn't really have time to call up and talk to before. Social distancing doesn't mean social isolation, so really do connect. Just as the impacts of this coronavirus pandemic ripple through society, so too do the actions of individuals struggling to make sense of it all. People do come together after tragedy. You know, I think that we have seen a lot of people come together and, and try to work to be on the same team. And I, to me, that, that's really inspiring.